According to the United Colonies, in 2150, humanity learned that the Earth's magnetosphere would collapse sometime in the next half century, eliminating all life on the planet. Decisive action was required, but the secure transport of an entire civilization would demand a new kind of cooperation, a new kind of courage, and a new kind of union. Thus, in 2159, the United Colonies were formed to make that journey possible. Just one year later, the Galileo, the first of many colony ships, touched down on Jemison, beginning a new era of human history, the age of the United Colonies. But there's more to this story than the UC is aware of, and it all starts with a man named Victor Iser. In 2137, Iser, this brilliant and dedicated scientist working for NASA, had recently led an expedition to Mars to investigate a strange anomaly. During his investigation, he found something unusual. Now, Judith Tatien, a theoretical physicist also working for NASA, was expecting rock samples or maybe fossils of microbial life. Instead, Isa was escorted by two members of the military. They commandeered one of the labs, and whatever Isa had discovered on Mars was sealed away. Then, two days later, Isa sent Judith a request for more information on her background in metallurgical engineering, the study and practice of transforming metals into useful everyday products. Four hours of talking to Isa about theoretical metals, atomic bonding, and magnetism, she was granted permission to enter the lab, and what she saw was unlike anything she had ever seen. What Isa had discovered on Mars was a mysterious object, and somehow he knew that this thing was the key to unlocking interstellar travel. So, Isa and Judith started working on a new device, the Grav Drive, a module that allows a ship to make faster than light jumps from one place to another. Now, Isa knew what needed to be done to create the Grav Drive, but Judith had no idea how he knew, he just did. So far, the scientists had no success extracting even a sample from the object. No explanation for the gravitational effects, no motion graph to explain its harmonic frequencies, they couldn't even establish a melting point. Yet, Isa kept coming up with new things for them to try, like he knew something was going to happen. And over the coming year, Judith built a prototype collider, a type of particle accelerator that brings two opposing particle beams together such that the particles collide. And now he wanted her to pump helium-3, a light, stable isotope, into it. Once she had, the prototype drive was turned on, and as Isa had long suspected, the gravitational field around the device began to fold. What they had achieved was the complete reversal of gravitational pull, and if manipulated in the right way, interstellar travel could be achieved. As a result, Isa set up a meeting with the directors at NASA to propose a larger test. Now the prototype demonstrated that they no longer needed the original and could now make more grav drives, but further work needed to be done somewhere with an abundance of helium-3. Helium-3 is a rare isotope on Earth, but it's abundant on the Moon, and according to the experts, mining helium-3 would be a profitable undertaking. The energy produced by helium-3 would be 250 times greater than that needed to extract and transport it to Earth, which is something they could have done, but by moving the device to the Moon, they cut out the return trips, which saved a lot of time and overall was much safer. But they also needed a civilian partner, someone with access to large-scale manufacturing resources and computational equipment. In this case, they decided to go with Nova Galactic, the first ship manufacturing corporation. Within a year, NASA and Nova Galactic were working together on the project, dubbed Project Prism. Isa's team remained on Earth, while on the Moon, a new team led by Lan Xu, the principal engineer, along with the help of Voltaire, Nova Galactic's supercomputer, perfected the grav drive. All the while, the Nova Galactic Star Yard, which orbited the Moon, focused on building the ship that would one day use the grav drive, 
although it would take a further two years for that ship to be ready. During that time, Xu repeatedly tried to wrap his head around the equations that Isaac gave him, and they were ambitious to say the least, even for a supercomputer. Isa might as well have been asking Voltaire to count every grain of sand in every desert on Earth, and he wasn't much help when it came to learning where the equations came from. So, Xu, much like Judith, just had to trust that Isa knew what he was doing. Once the ship was ready, the grav drive was attached, and the ship, destined for Jupiter, made the jump in the blink of an eye, a journey that previously would have taken years to achieve. Interstellar travel was no longer this impossible feat, and now there was talk of manufacturing hundreds of grav drives and expeditions to Alpha Centauri, which made Judith both overwhelmed and worried for the future. It could take years, decades even, before they knew what the side effects of operating a grav drive were, but no one seemed to care. Instead, they acted like pioneers, racing towards the edges of the frontier without giving a second thought for the bear in the woods. Eight years, and who knows how many grav drives later, Isa, Judith, and Shu talked about how Project Prism was the highlight of their careers, and now all they seemed to be doing was launching weather satellites. But Isa had another new project in mind, Project Demeter. Isa explained that he wanted Nova Galactic to manufacture scanners to better track a new meteorological pattern that had appeared. Judith guessed that the reason for this new pattern could be the Earth's poles naturally shifting, causing some gravitational fluctuations that were throwing off their old models. As such, they needed the scanning tolerances of the new model to be incredibly small, because Isa wanted to be sure although what of, he didn't say. Well, a few months later, after analyzing the new data, they discovered that the measurements of the Earth's magnetosphere showed clear signs of fluctuation, often in correlation to the periods of frequent and large gravity wave spikes emanating from the Moon. These gravity waves seem to be affecting the magnetic shield provided by the Earth's inner core, and the data indicated the change rate was increasing exponentially. Simply put, as the Earth's magnetosphere falters, its ability to protect us from the Sun's solar wind also falters. Beyond the devastating effects of solar radiation, this would eventually lead to something more dire. The sputtering, or stripping away, of our atmosphere. Apparently this has happened before, to Mars, and now it was going to happen again, to Earth. A day later, the scientists realized that the grav drives were the cause. All of the jumps from the moon had disrupted Earth's magnetosphere, and given enough time, Earth's atmosphere would sputter into space, transforming the lush planets into a desolate wasteland. Now, Xu did manage to work on the grav drive design and discreetly solved the problem, masquerading the change as an emergency update to the fueling pumps which ensured that from there on, no other planet's magnetosphere would be affected. However, there was no way to reverse the damage already done to Earth. And the only thing that could save humanity from certain death was the grav drive itself, the very thing that caused the problem. Isa couldn't risk people losing faith in the grav drive technology, so instead of telling humanity the truth, that they had made a mistake, he allowed them to see the sputtering as an act of God, one that science had found a solution for. Judith doesn't know how, but she's certain that Isa knew this was going to happen. She had dedicated the best years of her life to the grav drive, all the while Isa allowed her to continue her work, knowing full well the damage it would do. Because Isa had seen the future, and he knew there was an infinite expanse of promise out there, so to him, sacrificing one world for countless others was worth it, and he justified his actions by saying that if humans remained on Earth, then one day a meteor, a plague, or another world war would eventually wipe us out. But now they could colonize other galaxies and secure humanity's future for all coming generations across all time. As expected, 
Judith didn't agree, while Shu only cared about building enough ships to get everyone off-world. But the most important thing to Isa was that humanity never learned the truth. And so, they were lied to. Humanity was told that leading experts had predicted the destruction of Earth, and due to some mysterious atmospheric phenomena, the planet's breathable air was going to sputter beyond the reach of gravity and doom all life that remained. But they didn't need to panic, because they still had 50 years to evacuate, which was more than enough time for NASA and other space agencies around the world to transport humanity into the stars. Ten years later, in 2160, Isa is still on Earth, and for one reason or another, he recorded his confession, and with this we can learn what truly happened that day on Mars. When Isa touched the object, he experienced 12 days of lost time. During that time, he met a slightly older version of himself who told him the future, about the grav drive equations, the tests on the moon, and the Earth's atmosphere sputtering into space because of what he had done. But he also told Isa about a city, thriving on a planet orbiting a distant star, and the various human cultures, art, music, and lifestyles evolving and shining brightly across all of space, all for the cost of Earth. After confessing, Isa either took his own life, or the Isa he spoke to, the one from another universe, killed him to prevent him from collecting any more artifacts. By 2199, the last Exodus fleet left Earth, and billions of people who were unable to evacuate in time were left stranded on a dying planet. And four years later, in 2203, it finally happened. Earth lost its magnetosphere, the atmosphere dissipated into space, and humanity's homeworld was rendered uninhabitable. By 2330, Earth is a very different place. Its continuous sandy deserts and frozen plains cover the entire surface, which, thanks to the sputtering, is plagued by solar radiation during the day. Across the vast landscape, you'll find no signs of life, only a few landmarks that suggest this desolate place was once able to sustain life. The structures that have yet to be buried will, in time, disappear completely, and once they have, there will be no reason to return to Earth, our old home, ever again. Be sure to show your support by liking the video and subscribing if you haven't already for more Starfield content. If there's anything you'd like to see in a later video, leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. With that said, thank you, as always, for watching, and I'll see you in the next adventure.